Dr. Pizak, let's begin with why you chose to do this particular study. So we wanted to estimate the distribution of some of the genetic haplotypes called HLA-DQ2 and DQ8 in the general population and the at-risk population for celiac disease. And then we wanted to determine the risk for celiac disease in these specific HLA-DQ groups and then stratify the risk for celiac disease. And then in the end assess is there any clinical utility to using genetic testing for celiac disease in an at-risk population. Can you briefly describe your methodology? Our methodology was that we collected over 10,000 samples from patients at risk for celiac disease. These patient samples included those with relatives who had celiac disease and those who were considered at risk by their physicians because of having symptoms of the disease. We then took these blood samples and analyzed them for anti-endomesial antibody and also HLA typing. The anti-endomesial IgA was measured with indirect immunofluorescence, and a positive titer was considered greater than 1 to 10. And then the EMA positivity was chosen as a surrogate marker for biopsy. The reason for this is that it has a very high sensitivity and specificity, and it also correlates with villus atrophy seen on biopsy for celiac disease. So how did we do this HLA genotyping? We used high-resolution, sequence-specific oligonucleotide probe typing, SSOP from the DNA isolated from the whole blood of the patient samples. We then did PCR amplification for 35 DQA1 and 37 DQB1 specific probes. These reactivity patterns were then interpreted using Lyris software to determine which alleles were present that are and are not associated with celiac disease. What were some of the highlights of the study? There are several highlights that I'd like to bring out from our research. In this first graph, you can see EMA positivity status by genotype category. On the y-axis are the percent of subjects who are EMA positive. As you can see in the first bar, those who are DQ2 homozygous, over 28% were positive for anti-endomesial antibody. DQ2.2 associated with another high-risk allele was 13.6% positive. If the patient had one DQ2 and one DQ8, they were roughly 12% positive. DQ2.5 heterozygous state was approximately 9% positive, and DQ8 homozygous state was 8% positive. There were lesser risks for EMA positivity in those who were DQ8 heterozygous, had DQ2.2 associated with an other low-risk allele, and very few were positive for anti-endomesial antibody who had neither DQ2 nor DQ8. Another highlight of the study is brought out in this second graph which demonstrates the odds ratio for EMA positivity in DQ2 and DQ8 haplotypes. As you can see from this graph, those who are DQ2 homozygous versus those who are DQ2.5 heterozygous had almost a fourfold odds ratio of being EMA positive with high significance. In column B, you can see similarly those who were DQ8 homozygous versus those who were DQ8 heterozygous also had almost a four-fold odds ratio of being EMA positive with high significance. There are several conclusions we can draw from this large data set. One is that this is the largest reported series of celiac genetics in an at-risk population in the United States, which utilizes 35 DQA1 and 37 DQB1 specific probes. We found that the rate of EMA positivity for those who are DQ2 homozygous is 28-fold that of the reported 1% prevalence for celiac disease in the U.S. population, and for the DQ2 heterozygous, about 9 to 14-fold. There are several clinical applications today from these findings. So one is that in our data set, we could rule out celiac disease in about 50% of those who were considered to be at risk in the U.S. population because they either had relatives with the disease or their physicians thought they had symptoms of the disease. For the rest, we could stratify them into clinically meaningful risk groups, including an extremely high to very high risk of development of celiac disease for those who were DQ2 homozygous, those who had DQ2 with an other high-risk gene, or those who were DQ2 with DQ8. There is another high-risk group, including those who are DQ2 heterozygous and those who are DQ8 homozygous. And interestingly, there was also an extremely low risk group, which included those who were negative for DQ2 and DQ8, but also those who had DQ2 paired with another low risk gene. That put them at decreased risk for celiac disease compared with the general population. 
So right now you're asking yourself, how am I going to use this test in my practice? And let me submit to you that there is a diagnostic utility of HLA in special populations. For example, patients may come to you already on a prolonged gluten-free diet, and they will have negative serologic testing and biopsies. But the HLA is still positive because it doesn't change regardless of diet. Also patients who have indeterminate serologies or biopsy. Or relatives of biopsy-proven celiac patients, including infants, who have not yet been exposed to gluten. There are patients with conditions that are more strongly associated with increased risk for celiac disease, and these include type 1 diabetes, Down syndrome, Williams syndrome, and Turner syndrome. Also, patients with autoimmune diseases on immune suppression may have falsely negative screening antibody tests. So under these circumstances, antibody testing may be negative. And remember that HLA testing does not change depending upon your diet. So even if a patient is on a gluten-free diet or has never been exposed to gluten, the HLA genes do not change. So I think it's important that physicians consider genetic testing for celiac disease when a patient comes to them already on a gluten-free diet and has negative antibody testing. So I hope that you are as excited as I am about the potential for HLA testing to screen for celiac disease. For more information about our research, Please see our article in Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology.